Chapter Twenty Three of the Sea Wolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sea Wolf by Jack London. Chapter Twenty Three. Brave winds blowing fair swiftly drove the ghost northward into the seal herd. We encountered it well up to the forty-fourth parallel, in a raw and stormy sea across which the wind harried the fog banks in eternal flight. For days at a time we could never see the sun nor take an observation. Then the wind would sweep the face of the ocean clean, the waves would ripple and flash, and we would learn where we were. A day of clear weather might follow, or three days, or four, and then the fog would settle down upon us, seemingly thicker than ever. The hunting was perilous, yet the boats, lowered day after day, were swallowed up in the grey obscurity, and were seen no more till nightfall, and often not till long after, when they would creep in like sea wraiths, one by one, out of the grey. Wainwright, the hunter whom Wolf Larsen had stolen with boat and men, took advantage of the veiled sea and escaped. He disappeared one morning in the encircling fog with his two men, and we never saw them again, though it was not many days when we learned that they had passed from schooner to schooner until they finally regained their own. This was the thing I had set my mind upon doing, but opportunity never offered. It was not in the mate's province to go out in the boats, and though I maneuvered cunningly for it, Wolf Larsen never granted me the privilege. Had he done so, I should have managed somehow to carry Miss Brewster away with me. As it was, the situation was approaching a stage which I was afraid to consider. I involuntarily shunned the thought of it, and yet the thought continually arose in my mind like a haunting spectre. I had read sea romances in my time, wherein figured, as a matter of course, the lone woman in the midst of a shipload of men. But I learned, now, that I had never comprehended the deeper significance of such a situation, the thing the writers hyped upon and exploited so thoroughly. And here it was, now, and I was face to face with it that it should be as vital as possible it required no more than that the woman should be maud brewster who now charmed me in person as she had long charmed me through her work no one more out of environment could be imagined she was a delicate ethereal creature swaying and willowy light and graceful of movement it never seemed to me that she walked or at least walked after the ordinary manner of mortals Hers was an extreme lithesomeness, and she moved with a certain indefinable airiness, approaching one as down might float, or as a bird on noiseless wings. She was like a bit of Dresden china, and I was continually impressed with what I may call her fragility. As at the time I caught her arm when helping her below, so at any time I was quite prepared, should stress or rough handling befall her, to see her crumble away. I have never seen body and spirit in such perfect accord. Describe her verse, as the critics have described it, as sublimated and spiritual, and you have described her body. It seemed to partake of her soul, to have analogous attributes, and to link it to life with the slenderest of chains. Indeed, she trod the earth lightly, and in her constitution there was little of the robust clay. She was in striking contrast to Wolf Larsen. Each was nothing that the other was, everything that the other was not. I noted them walking the deck together one morning, and I likened them to the extreme ends of the human ladder of evolution. The one, the culmination of all savagery, the other the finished product of the finest civilization. True, Wolf Larsen possessed instinct to an unusual degree, but it was directed solely to the exercise of his savage instincts, and made him but the more formidable a savage. He was splendidly muscled, a heavy man, and though he strode with the certitude and directness of the physical man, there was nothing heavy about his stride. The jungle and the wildness lurked in the uplift and downput of his feet. He was gat-footed and lithe and strong, always strong. I likened him to some great tiger, a beast of prowess and prey. 
He looked it, and the piercing glitter that arose at times in his eyes was the same piercing glitter I had observed in the eyes of caged leopards and other preying creatures of the wild. But this day, as I noted them pacing up and down, I saw that it was she who terminated the walk. They came up to where I was standing by the entrance of the companionway. Though she betrayed it by no outward sign, I felt, somehow, that she was greatly perturbed. She made some idle remark, looking at me, and laughed lightly enough, but I saw her eyes return to his, involuntarily, as though fascinated. Then they fell, but not swiftly enough to veil the rush of terror that filled them. It was in his eyes that I saw the cause of her perturbation. Ordinarily gray and cold and harsh, they were now warm and soft and golden, and all a dance with tiny lights that dimmed and faded or welled up till the full orbs were flooded with a glowing radiance. Perhaps it was to this that the golden color was due, but golden his eyes were, enticing and masterful, at the same time alluring and compelling, and speaking the demand and clamor of blood which no woman, much less Maud Brewster, could misunderstand. Her own terror rushed upon me, and in that moment of fear, the most terrible fear a man can experience, I knew that in inexpressible ways she was dear to me. The knowledge that I loved her rushed upon me with the terror, and with both emotions gripping at my heart and causing my blood at the same time to chill and to leap riotously, I felt myself drawn by a power without me and beyond me, and found my eyes returning against my will to gaze into the eyes of Wolf Larsen. But he had recovered himself. The golden color and the dancing lights were gone, gray and cold, and glittering they were, as he bowed brusquely and turned away. "'I am afraid,' she whispered with a shiver. "'I am so afraid.' I, too, was afraid, and what of my discovery of how much she meant to me, my mind was in a turmoil, but I succeeded in answering quite calmly. "'All will come right, Miss Brewster. Trust me, it will come right.' She answered with a grateful little smile that sent my heart pounding, and started to descend the companion stairs. For a long while I remained standing where she had left me. There was imperative need to adjust myself to consider the significance of the changed aspects of things. It had come, at last, love had come, when I least expected it and under the most forbidding conditions. Of course, my philosophy had always recognized the inevitableness of the love call sooner or later, but long years of booky silence had made me inattentive and unprepared. And now it had come. Maud Brewster. My memory flashed back to that first thin little volume on my desk, and I saw before me, as though in the concrete, the row of thin little volumes on my library shelf. How I had welcomed each of them! Each year one had come from the press, and to me each was the advent of the year. They had voiced a kindred intellect and spirit, and as such I had received them into a camaraderie of the mind, but now their place was in my heart. My heart? A feeling of revulsion came over me. I seemed to stand outside myself and to look at myself incredulously. Maud Brewster. Humphrey Van Wyden, the cold-blooded fish the emotionless monster, the analytical demon of Charlie Furrisu's christening, in love. And then, without rhyme or reason, all skeptical, my mind flew back to the small biographical note in the red-bound Who's Who, and I said to myself, She was born in Cambridge, and she is twenty-seven years old. And then I said, Twenty-seven years old and still free and fancy-free? But how did I know she was fancy-free? And the pang of newborn jealousy put all incredulity to flight. There was no doubt about it. I was jealous, therefore I loved. And the woman I loved was Maud Brewster. I, Humphrey Van Wyden, was in love. And again the doubt assailed me. Not that I was afraid of it, however, or reluctant to meet it. 
On the contrary, idealist that I was to the most pronounced degree, my philosophy had always recognized and girded love as the greatest thing in the world, the aim and the summit of being, the most exquisite pitch of joy and happiness to which life could thrill, the thing of all things to be hailed and welcomed and taken into the heart. But now that it had come, I could not believe. I could not be so fortunate. It was too good, too good to be true. Simmons lines came into my head. I wandered all these years among a world of women seeking you. And then I had ceased seeking. It was not for me this greatest thing in the world, I had decided. Furra South was right. I was abnormal, an emotionless monster, a strange bookish creature, capable of pleasuring in sensations only of the mind. And though I had been surrounded by women all my days, my appreciation of them had been aesthetic and nothing more. I had actually, at times, considered myself outside the pale. A monkish fellow denied the eternal or the passing passions I saw and understood so well in others. And now it had come. Undreamed of and unheralded, it had come. In what could have been no less than an ecstasy, I left my post at the head of the companionway and started along the deck, murmuring to myself these beautiful lines of Mrs. Browning. I lived with visions for my company instead of men and women years ago, and found them gentle mates, nor thought to know, a sweeter music than they played to me. But the sweeter music was playing in my ears, and I was blind and oblivious to all about me. The sharp voice of Wolf Larsen aroused me. "'What the hell are you up to?' he was demanding. I had strayed forward where the sailors were painting, and I came to myself to find my advancing foot on the verge of overturning a paint pot. "'Sleepwalking? Sunstroke? What?' he barked. "'No, indigestion,' I retorted and continued my walk as though nothing untoward had occurred. End of chapter 23